Hello everyone. I, um, I'm trying something, another thing a little different today. Um, I, I put a pause on my channel for uh, critique just uh, after doing a little bit of reflection and also uh, my partner Jack and gave me a little bit of feedback and, and I might start over on that but uh, mostly because I, I, she was saying I was a little bit rambly at the start and didn't have a clear focus of what I wanted to talk about and, and uh, so I wanted to kind of do a little bit more prep work before I got into that because some of the issues I'm going to bring up are relative to this interview that I'm going to show you here. Um, so basically, um, Kai Nagata was a CTV uh, reporter. Um, he, at the time, just before he quit his job, he, and he was the head of the Quebec uh, news department, I think, in CTV. Uh, it said at the beginning of the video here, but I, I've skipped over it. Uh, just to get into the start of his presentation, but basically this is a lecture he gave shortly after he quit, uh, very publicly with a blog post that made quite a lot of noise about his issues with the state of television news. Um, interesting enough, this interview starts with him asking the audience uh, in, at, at, at the at this lecture how many watch have a television uh, for one and use TV to watch news, and this is back in 2011, uh, and there were a lot of people who didn't. Uh, so yeah, so it, we're now, uh, you know, six and a half, or s yeah, seven and a half, no, six and a half years later, I expect that is a, you know, far worse a situation as far as people who actually watch uh, television news or news produced for television. Um, now, so, but let's go into the, I'm going to let this video play mostly, I'll probably stop it here and there just to kind of go into what I find is interesting points, or, or especially if the context has changed since this lecture, uh, but uh, like I said it's a lot of relative relevant stuff here, and, and I wanted to refresh myself as well. Uh, I haven't watched this probably since around 2011, sometime. Uh, so I just want to get this stuff fresh in my mind and some of his points so that I can bring them into the Channel Four lecture when I, when I get back to it. Uh, so here I'm going to start this up. Uh, let me transition over here, and uh, we will get this going, and uh, I'll. Like I said, I'm going to try and let her play as much as I can because it is a fairly lengthy video, almost uh, an hour, but uh, I will stop where I need to. Okay. Well, we're fans. <laughs> so people, are we generally agreed that TV news could be better? Uh, yeah. That is? Okay, so I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of crappy TV news. Um, <laughs> we call the talk, Can We Salvage TV News? Which is a rhetorical question. Uh, I don't want to keep you in suspense. I don't think we can salvage TV news the way that it is set up right now. Um, but I think it's really important to draw a distinction between TV news as an industry and video journalism, or visual journalism as a craft or as an institution. Because of course, um, I do believe, and a lot of people accuse me uh, otherwise, but I, I believe that journalism is one of those pillars that holds the roof up of the democracy and it's something that has to be strong. The problem is right now that it's actually weakened itself as an institution in a way that I think makes it kind of dangerously Anyway, I'll get to that a little later. But um, the point is that I, I know, and I think you know, a lot of fantastic interviewers and writers and storytellers and videographers across Canada. It's not that there's a lack of talent or that there's somehow, you know, it's just that we're not attracting the right candidates, I think. And so I know a lot of people who walk away from these news organizations um, or who never joined in the first place who could be fantastic assets to Canadian journalism. And I know a lot of people who are still working inside these news organizations where I believe that their full potential might never be realized. So I just want to tell you a little bit about my uh, old boss at CTV. So this is uh, Kevin Krull, and I'm going to make fun of him a little bit, but I think he's a, he is generally a really fantastic guy. Uh, he's got lovely kids, he's running a marathon. He's uh, a corporate citizen with a vision for the future. And uh, yeah, so he's the CEO of Bell Media. So he's in charge of Discovery Channel and Bravo and Space and TSN and MTV and Munch Music and a shitload of radio stations and CTV's up there and CTV News is right up there. So is Kevin Kroll uh, a former journalist? One would hope. He has the rugged good looks. The bone structure, no, he comes from Nestle. So he comes to us from Ohio, where for 10 years he sold Kit Kats and this coffee and carnations and milk and a whole bunch of other processed crap. Yeah. So according to prevailing market logic, there's no difference between this chocolate syrup and this chocolate syrup. Anytime we have a party, he gets on the piano and 
Um, you know, we have a drum set in the corner and guitars. and So we're always doing that in our private life. That's what we do. That's what he does every night. She, she's very opinion, opinionated <laughs> about song selection. I will, I will tell you that much. Yeah. So there is an argument for why information has to be a commodity. And that's that if you can draw in enough viewers by whatever means and run enough ads, that you can pay for the journalism that actually strengthens the democracy, right? It's the spoonful of sugar argument, where I guess the sugar is uh, this kind of stuff, and the medicine would be uh, investigative journalism, the kind of stuff that holds decision makers to account, the kind of stuff that exposes lies, that takes down presidents, Woodward Bernstein, not TV reporters, but still, um, and foreign coverage, this very, very expensive form of journalism that reminds us of our sheer humanity and our place in the world, our role and our responsibilities as Canadians, I mean, this is important stuff. And the other thing that I think uh, justifies the commodification of news is, is truly local news, that community-level journalism that really builds neighborhoods and builds connections between people. Um, and those things, I think, if, if that was the bulk of what we're watching, you could very well argue would be worth sitting through all those ads. Maybe the format has to change a little bit in terms of on-demand video, that kind of stuff, but uh, they're all very worthwhile forms, I think, of television journalism. There's ways that you can use the media very well to do all those things, but something clearly is wrong, and uh, I think it's just a case of, of too much uh, sugar and not enough medicine, I guess. So uh, I took a lot of heat for pointing this out to being 24, and then these guys in their 60s and 70s who spent whole careers actually confirmed that I'm not just walking into this and sort of declaring the whole institution to be corrupt, but they, they anyway, according to these guys, who've worked there for 30 to 40 years, something actually has changed. That it's not just in our imaginations, that there's something that has gradually shifted and there's been a sort of hollowing out of this institution in the last 30 or 40 years. So that's what we're sort of trying to explore right now. This um, is what we now call investigative journalism. There are dozens of licensed businesses that have raunchy ads promising a lot more than your average massage. One of the more low-key ads in this adult online section belongs to KK Acupuncture in Richmond. With the help of our undercover volunteer and a hidden camera, we checked out what exactly was being offered. The sign at the store says traditional Chinese medicine. As soon as our man entered, the manager, Wendy, closed the door. He asked what kind of service he could get with his discount coupon and how much. Total, total 80 to 100? Okay, and uh, what can I get with that? I can give you traffic massage and a hand job. Okay, what is a hand job? Is, do you do, is a hand job, what, what is it exactly? Is it just a... Is it masturbation? Any thoughts? Reflections? Some might call these times a gold rush. I'm just wondering how that strikes you. The way it's built, the way it's packaged, the way it's presented, and what you're actually seeing, I don't know if there's any immediate reaction. Like, the intro section makes it look like they're trying to make it look exactly like CSI or Cold Case or any of the, like, crime drama TV series um, that have come out of the last few years. That's interesting. There, there, of course, there is a, there's a malpractice issue here, right? There's an accountability issue because they're, as we find out later, after all of the hand job stuff, they're offering receipts, like you can write it off on your medical expenses. So I guess for that particular acupuncture clinic, that's an issue. But this is part of something that I term consumer protection journalism. And I just want to show you another example from another CTV investigation looking at a popular infomercial. Some might call these times a gold rush. The price of gold has soared, and it seems people want to cash in. Dollars for gold will give you more cash for your gold than anyone else. That's our guarantee. It seems to me as like most of us, Amanda O'Byrne saw this ad. It's appealing. They say that they, they have the highest payout, um, and if you're not satisfied, well, then they send the gold back, no questions asked. So she thought, why not? I sent uh, diamond, a diamond engagement ring, um, a band, a uh, few silver items, an earring. She was hoping for good money. What she was offered surprised her. You expect a few hundred dollars for more than one item. And what was the offer? $21. 
do you see the connection between those two pieces? Does anyone want to explore that? Oh, consumer, consumer rates of protection, what you said. It's already towards the purchasing practices of the business industry. What about the effort to reward ratio? These are pretty easy stories to put together. Because it's just like running a trap line or putting a fish hook in the water, right? If you have a news organization, people are going to call you and say, I got ripped off, or I expected a hand job, or something else. And you just go and put two or three days, right? These take two days to put together. And you run to ground and you have a seven minute special report about how dollars for gold is a rip off. Um, but the problem is that it doesn't actually examine any of these underlying cultural questions, like why do we send our money to strangers in the mail? Or why do we pay for sex? I mean, there's like legitimate questions that they could be exploring, um, but instead we're doing a form of journalism that's billed as sort of hard-hitting investigative reporting, but nothing changes. I mean, it doesn't point to any solutions. It doesn't point to any alternative models. It doesn't do anything beyond maybe move that acupuncture clinic down the block or stop people from mailing their money to dollars for gold. Yeah. How come it's easy for uh, a news reporter to go then and to critique KK, the acupuncture clinic, and to moralize that and to say you're doing something really bad? Because that's what they're doing. They're saying that's what they're doing. People are also really bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's not okay for them to take that same sort of uh, like more judgmental or like analytical stance on these broader yeah. like societal issues. Well, we're going to get into that because when I talk about this notion of you want to say objectivity, but when you talk about opinions in journalism, you're absolutely allowed to have opinions. I mean, we're encouraged to have opinions. We're encouraged to add them on air. You know, oh, you know, very silent story. And you can say things that fit with the sort of existing, I guess, status quo that they're that they're defending. The problem is that there's a lot of underlying assumptions and biases, which as university professors, I'm sure uh, none of this is new to you. But um, this is something that uh, that is starting to, I guess, define. Uh, the nature of this kind of accountability work, the expense of longer projects or uh, maybe deeper digging projects that might actually point to some alternatives, some changes. Uh, so why do we do these easy stories? It's because every hour that every cameraman out on OT costs money. Every reporter that you pull away from the cat in the tree for two days is a hole that other people have to fill. And every newsroom feels understaffed all the time. And every night it's a minor miracle that you get an hour of television to air. Like it's just, that's the reality. It's like, all hands on deck all the time. So if you're a regular reporter, it means you actually have to fight really hard to do investigative work. You have to expend a lot of energy just arguing with your own bosses to be able to do something even for two days or three days like this. Um, so how about... Sorry, I just want to stop right there for a second because that, that's really one of the key parts when I'm going and analyzing these uh, you know, more modern news pieces is you know, trying to understand the underlying motivations and, and also the amount of effort that was put in, into it. And, and the Channel 4 interview in particular, um, it was a really low effort approach. Um, the uh, team at Channel 4, whether it was the reporter who did the interview or some other people working and assembled the story and the questions, uh, I don't know, it depends on how their infrastructure, how their organization is structured, but... Um, but basically, they took and already took a, a narrative that was floating around about uh, Jordan Peterson being a uh, you know a voice of this alt right, and and then they based their entire interview around that premise without doing the due diligence of actually going to his YouTube channel, watching his videos, or even finding other places online where he's done interviews or he's talked to people about the types of issues they wanted to bring up uh, because if they had have done any of that work they wouldn't have asked half the questions that they asked them they could have had a completely different type of conversation and and this is exactly what we end up with that we have you know news organizations that are producing news content uh, that is very light and fluffy and cheap and easy uh, as opposed to real proper journalism which is hard and a lot of effort and a lot of behind the scenes work um, and, and that is con that's a major contributing factor to why the quality of news in general is degrading, especially video news, um, because the, old, you know, the main people that are producing this content are still the old dinosaur television networks. 
um, who are who are trying to streamline their process as much as possible and strip out as many people as they can of the process so they can reduce that bottom line to increase their profits. Again, it becomes a uh, news should never be profit based. News should never be about making money. It should always be about um, you know sourcing out information. Now, unfortunately, it, that type of work still has to get funded, and and the pre existing systems that used to fund this type of thing are breaking down. They're, they're breaking down catastrophically now in 2018. Um, but they were even breaking down back when this was done. So I'm going to continue on here. Talking about the sort of three pillars, I guess, of responsible or, or, uh, or good journalism to moral, moralize. Um, and that was uh, investigative, international, and, and local. So how about international coverage? And there it is, and we have the information about the dress. It is, in fact, Sarah Burton of Alexander McQueen. But there's a lot of Kate Middleton in that dress, I can tell you. So I don't know how much those anchors make, I can guess. Uh, I don't know how much it costs to fly from London. I don't know how much it costs to rent the satellites per hour, but it's in the $600 an hour range just for the network window. Uh, but I do know that this kind of pre-packaged, stage-managed celebrity uh, reporting is TV gold, right? Because it keeps you on deadline, it keeps you on schedule. It's absolutely worth the investment because there's free spectacle, it's all choreographed, and you have to expend a very set amount of money to get this kind of, I guess, bang for your buck. So that's why every network, of course, left on the chance to do a huge takeout 24 hour, three day special on the wedding and then again on the visit because you literally get this map mailed to you where it's like, here's where they're going to walk and here's where you're going to set up your cameras. And it's like, it's like no-brainer TV. As for real international coverage, I don't know, I was watching CTV National News last night, and a Tom Kennedy piece from this like horrible scene in Nairobi where this pipeline had exploded and there's all these burnt kids and stuff, and there's all these dead people in these little king shacks. And then at the end, there's no stand-up, he just signs off from London. And you realize that he's just reading in a room, it's called making radio, right? It's radio with pictures from other people's networks, and you see this all the time where they talk about the plane crash in Russia and all the dead hockey players. It's just like amateur military video that they've ripped off of YouTube or from another network. And it's literally the cheapest possible way to even mention overseas events and still call what you're making television. But that doesn't mean that, well, the fact is, um, despite all this marketing jargon about news renewal, these, these people are all closing international bureaus, not open, right? So Tom Kennedy is in London. Uh, CTV closed Kampala and Moscow, so they've got two reporters in Washington, one in LA, New Delhi, Beijing, and Jerusalem. <coughs> Global has Washington, London, Delhi, and New Delhi for whatever reason. CBC is doing something interesting. They have their partnership with Magic Canada, so they're moving to use bilingual correspondence. Have you noticed this? Watching like XE, they've got the same people on both networks, which saves them a lot of money. Uh, and Sun News doesn't have any overseas bureaus, but they do manage to do a little bit of investigative overseas enterprise journalism. Great ideas come from everywhere, and frankly, folks, kids are kids. So any good ideas we have about looking after the education of our young people, I think it's worth doing. He's also got some thoughts on health care. That'll probably make some of you mad. But anyway, without further ado, I want to send you to our discussion with former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. Governor Bush, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Leo. They occasionally splash out on some international coverage, but um, yeah, like the time during the, uh, the election campaign when they were doing a story about jacking up gas prices, the NDP policy and cap and trade, and they had these uh, stocks of gas stations with gallons. Anyway, they do accidental foreign coverage, but they're really not that interested in things that are happening outside of their own little brains. So the last cat. Sorry, so just to reiterate here, so that's another form of cheap journalism that he's talking about, again, the, the pre-packaging of video content from elsewhere. Um, and again, this is, this is something that you will still see quite regularly, and, and particularly in Canada, um, I think the global reporting is probably worse now even than when he was talking about. Um, I'm curious, to, I'd be curious to know if uh, CBC or CTV or Global have reduced their international presence even more over that time. I don't even know where you'd find that information. I'm guessing he got this from the industry somehow. Um, but it's this type of information. Like, that's one of the issues I have with, with a lot of traditional media is that it's not transparent 
how the sausage is being made and and the type of product that we're getting is is slowly being degraded over decades now um, to the point where the quality of information that we're getting is less diverse it's less in depth it's more superficial and uh, you know this is creating a more disconnected society now that isn't you know it doesn't help the fact that a lot of the younger audience is doesn't even watch television news anymore um, but there isn't a good replacement for it yet um, about the best that there is is that there's definitely uh, independent pundits out there especially on YouTube there are a number of um, various parts of the political spectrum uh, especially in the states but but there are uh, you know uh, independent opinion uh, uh, commentators that are producing regular content on on YouTube or over podcasts or whatnot um, but as far as this this really the one of the key parts of what journalism does is go out and and bring you stories about the world that you don't get a t chance to get exposed to very often and helps you get a you know informs you so you have a better picture of what's going on in the world in general and that like i said is, is degrading at a rapid pace everywhere but in canada in particular it's it's in in dire shape today uh, and, and unless you go and seek out other sources so uh, let's continue on here and ruby local television um the community building stuff, and unfortunately, uh, local television is in a fight for its life. I mean, if it hasn't already lost uh, in most markets in Canada, you've got some religious stations in like Hardston, Alberta, and Abbotsford. You've got uh, the Omni multicultural stations in the big cities. You've got a, a shrinking number of, uh, of independents, and the rest of them have been bought up by the big networks. So what you have now is a situation where CTV runs one local newscast for all of Northern Ontario. Right, so like Sudbury, Timmins, Wawa's are all watching the same newscast. Or the Maritimes, CTV does the same thing. One local newscast for the Maritimes, and then they'll have reporters popping up from the bureaus in Moncton and, and Newfoundland. Um, and Global, <laughs> well, CBC is a good example. I mean, we used to have to fill these 90 minute newscasts, right? So we'd all be on three times. And the rest of the time, they'd fill it out with syndication. And that's another tool that the networks are using more and more. When they've got these stations, this is why you're watching news in Vancouver and you suddenly see a story about a, like a three-legged dog with a heart of gold in Moncton, that's because they've syndicated that content so they can fill up these monster nine-minute newscasts. Um, and that brings me to Global, which is maybe the saddest example. Uh, and they, uh, they only have 11 stations nationwide, and all of their operations for some reason are run out of Calgary. So the anchors now just sit in these little rooms like with no text. I don't think they even have a cameraman, because this is a robot. And of course, there's um, mistakes that happen because all the text and calories, so you've got global maritimes popping up as a the part of the global material station. But that's kind of meta, right? Because the point I'm making is that they're all uh, um, totally interchangeable, basically. Um, in fact, they do weather hits and stuff where people pretend to give you the local weather when they're on a green screen in another city. So you're not making jobs, you're not covering local events, etc. So if investigative budgets have shrunk, and if local TV is almost dead, and if foreign coverage is being clawed back, I guess the question is what we're watching and how we're filling those 60 minutes or 90 minutes uh, here at CBC. And the answer is in the form of a kind of green video. Action News, Delaware Valley's leading news program with Gary Papa and Rob Jennings. Saturday night, the weather was picture perfect for a parade in Center City, Philadelphia, and Miss Universe joins the festivities at tonight's Puerto Rican Week banquet at the Franklin Plaza. But the big story in Action News is another breakdown in talks to end Philadelphia's newspapers. So that's not a SCTV joke. That's uh, the legacy of Frank and Maggot. So anytime you're watching this, um, Accident coverage, uh, health scares, weather stories, uh, entertainment, feel-good stories, anchor chit-chat. All of this was invented and codified and standardized by this guy, uh, Frank Maggie. So he's what we call the godfather of local television news, uh, the guy who pioneered this action news format. And I'm not joking about his influence. Like, the Maggot consultants literally, we call them the Maggots, very creative. They would crawl through the hallways of the CBC uh, telling us how to keep viewers simultaneously anxious and stimulated. They have this like technique they teach anchors to be both relaxed and intense. And literally, these people come up from Marion, Iowa, which is where this guy was 
database, and they're in every newsroom across the continent and beyond. And this is one consultancy, Frank and Maggot, proved uh, in, in this one market in Delaware that if you can uh, sort of keep people on the edge of their seat and turn it into infotainment, uh, that you will boost your ratings. And of course, you make shitloads of money. So that's very hard to ignore when you're the competition and you've still got Walter Cronkite sitting there. I mean, Cronkite, by the way, called this guy all sorts of names. Uh, the most trusted newsman in America that had no kind words for Frank Maggot because Cronkite was the example that Maggot used of what was wrong with TV journalism. He would just sit there and tell you things that you assumed were true. And then he would show you film. And then he would talk to you more. And so if you want to ask yourself why Peter Mansbridge walks around on set, it's literally because of Maggot. Like, that's what the consultants told us to do. Um, other examples. Why is it being live all the time? Right? Why do you have these whooshing graphics and the tickers that bring facts by that are too quick and they're going in the wrong direction and not about the thing that they're talking about? Yeah. Also invented by these guys. Um, why do you have two anchors? You know the format of two anchors and then the weather presenter walks in and they banter and chit chat and they have like 30 seconds to fill time for the next item? Also invented by these guys. I mean, everything that's familiar about local television news and it's now seeped into network coverage and this is what the national looks like now. Uh, it's all informed by the research and the statistics and psychology that was conducted by these dudes in the settings. So why does Maggot exist? Why have all the station managers uh, lined up to drink the Kool-Aid? Uh, the easy answer is ratings. And the ratings are important because if you're the CDC, you need to be able to prove to James Moore that you're fulfilling your mandate so that you don't get your federal funding slash. Uh, and if the CDC does this infotainment action news, then there's no pressure on the private networks to do anything remotely credible, right? Because they're not being out journalistic, journalisted in their own markets. So there's nothing motivating anybody to do anything that costs more money than necessary to retain that viewership. So it's turned the local TV market into this kind of sick scramble for ratings where they send out congratulatory, self-congratulatory press releases about like a 0.5% bump in the ratings month over month. And that's all they think about. So the people that they now have running these newsrooms are not former journalists. They're bean counters. So I just want to stop right there because he, he goes over that point really quickly about the CBC um, in that. Uh, so a lot of the problems with national and international journalism these days is coming much from this source where uh, news has been commoditized and turned into a sexy hot product that you can sell. Uh, the idea of getting as many eyeballs on it as possible so that that justifies ad buy-in. Um, and and when you have a commercial news venture like CTV or Global, that makes sense in, in to a, some degree. I'm not saying it's right, but they're a for-profit organization. They should, you know, if they, if that's the, 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 there's nothing preventing them from doing this, I guess. There's no reason them for them not to, especially when the one, in Canada, the one organization that is a public entity, paid for by taxpayers, is doing the exact same tactics they're, they're abandoning their responsibility to set the, the, set the tempo, to set the, the, the waterline of what is quality journalism in this country. And they're the only ones that have uh, a motivating factor to change. And again, that's because they should not be profit-based. Uh, the National never used to have advertising because it was never intended to be a commercial product. It was meant to try and deliver as much informative news to the viewer as possible within the hour timeline. So it was trying to be packed full of useful, practical information that helps both you understand the state of the world today, its issues, as well as potential solutions and, and, and whatnot. And when they fall by the wayside and start to turn their news into a product as opposed to a message, you know, a, something that's meant to help communicate and inform. It's more about entertainment now, and also entertainment at the lowest cost possible. Uh, and and this is feeding many of this, many of the terrible processes that have been introduced into journalism. Uh, that uh, we'll get back to when I get to the Channel Four interview. But anyway, uh, let's continue on. Um. <clears throat> Newscasts are 30 or 60 or 90 minutes long because uh, we've already sold the ad spaces, right? But the problem I have is that uh, not all news days are created equal. So maybe once a decade, uh, you'll have 
an event like 9 11 where you have to spend the whole weekend in front of the TV just to sort of understand the cultural import of what's going on. And then maybe two or three times a year, you know, they'll shoot Osama or you'll have Hurricane Katrina or, you know, you'll have a wellhead spewing millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf. And that might warrant a full day just sitting in front of the TV. But most days, I think it's debatable whether uh, spending 60 minutes plunked down in front of the TV news is going to make you a better informed citizen and participant in this democracy. So <clears throat> what they've done is hollow out this, this institution. It's literally like taking tiles out of a, a Jenga game with job cuts and with the convergence, syndication, consolidation. They've managed to keep the facade looking pretty good, uh, but the foundations are extremely weak. And you can measure that just by being in a newsroom and realizing how close they are to total crisis and black air, dead air every night. Uh, so as a, as a force for, uh, for maintaining democracy, let alone pointing to positive or progressive social change, uh, I decided that TV news is not a medium that I can put another day of my effort into. But that's not to say that we didn't try. Quebec is being accused of hypocrisy. The province exports asbestos to developing countries while banning the material from buildings here at home. Well, now the prestigious medical journal The Lancet has joined the campaign against Canadian asbestos. And this as the Chare government is considering a major investment to expand production. Kai Nagata reports. The streets in this town are literally paved with asbestos. It's in tar, gravel and all that, and packed in. Réal Bachin and his wife Colette are happily retired. Both spent long careers in Canada's largest open pit mine. This is Asbestos, Quebec. In the 50s, every time a new hole was blasted, the fibers fell like snow over nearby houses. And we used to make balls and throw balls at each other, and like, just like in the wintertime. Both say they're healthy. If I believe the specialist, we should have been dead by six, I should have been dead. And our, our own, our old family should have been dead too, and the whole town should have been dead. It was snowing here. The town is dying in a different way. Ever since medical studies established the link with cancer, demand has withered, and so have jobs. That's what Min Jeffrey Project means for us. Younger people and uh, the time to diversify our economy f for the uh, next 25 years. The town is pleading with the Quebec government to guarantee a $58 million loan that would get the mine running full steam but a delegation has traveled halfway around the world to ask that the mine be shut down completely. Who wrote all asbestos victims are watching you? Please stop the export asbestos from Canada. You can do it. She has terminal cancer, something 82-year-old Paul Dussault just can't wrap his head around. Some guys died, he says, but they were smokers. They lived hard. The mineral itself is safe when properly handled, says part-time miner, part-time lobbyist Serge Bollard. They just have to put a mask and there is no problem. Just by providing mask, we cannot ensure, you know, that there won't be cases. And, you know, if it's so safe, then why uh, it's not being used here in Canada? The minister says Quebec inspectors could maybe help ensure safety standards overseas. So this is the challenge. That's the reason we have no, we have not taken a decision yet. So do you save a real town right here in Quebec, or do you bank on potentially saving lives overseas? That's the dilemma faced by the Quebec government. People here are hoping for a decision by Christmas. Kai Nagata, CTV News, Asbestos. So journalistically, I call that piece pretty weak. Um, that's one of my favorite stories that we actually had the time to do at CTV. And uh, I don't think it really does any of the things that it needed to do. Um, because what this piece needs is a doctor, right? You need somebody who represents the legions of medical researchers who are unanimous in condemning Canadian exports to take you over to a uh, lab and show you in a microscope what this shit does to human lung tissue, right? And then you need to fly to Southeast Asia and you need to get the footage of the guys in the loincloths lifting this with no protective gear and just throwing like raw fibers into the cement mixer with this bag that says asbestos Quebec. 
next to the cement mixer. And then you need to go to some worker's home and film him like coughing up blood while his children cry. And then you fly back and you sit down with the Quebec Premier. And you ask him how he can possibly make an independent decision about this when he accepted money from a campaign fundraiser organized by the businessman who's trying to reopen the mine. And then you sit down with Stephen Harper and you ask him how he can ignore Chuck Straw, his former conservative MP, who's among the 10% of mesothelioma patients who survive, and is now saying, at least don't block it from going on the hazardous species list. At least, not species, substances. Like, let alone the question about exporting it. Like, just try not to look like an asshole on the global stage. Harper ignores Straw, and then, <laughs> You need to go to France, okay, because there's activists right now organizing a tourism boycott. There are economic implications beyond the jobs in asbestos because they're preparing a campaign right now featuring snow-capped Canadian mountains covered in this hazardous white fiber. Then you go back to asbestos and you ask people what their dream job would be if there was any economy in the town other than this cancer pit. And then you ask them what they could do with $58 million in government loans if they were to put it into any other industry. Right? So that would take two weeks or three weeks. And it would take flights to France and Southeast Asia. Melissa Fung, to her credit, and the CBC's credit, did actually go to Asia and get that footage of the guys like tossing asbestos fiber. But CTV did because we're a private network. And that would make any fiscal sense. So the deal went through. And the PQ backed down, the official opposition backed down because they have strong ties to the unions that wanted those jobs in that town. And so rather than looking at any kind of alternative solution, they are going to now sink $58 million of this loan guarantee and reopen the mine. And another generation of workers in Quebec is going to go down. And luckily they have, you know, space age protective gear, so they're probably going to survive, kind of like their grandfathers, but the people in Southeast Asia are not going to be helped by having like two Quebec government inspectors fly over there once a year and say, are you wearing masks? So, I was also working for CTV. Um, I don't know if this is something controversial to say to Ubik, but uh, uh, Senator Mike Duffy and Senator Pamela Wallen are both former CTV broadcasters, now appointed by the Conservatives for the Senate. Um, you saw that spectacle at the beginning of the annual exclusive sit down interview with Robert Fife and Lloyd uh, with a Minister sits down with them because they're a friendly broadcaster. Um, but this is hypothetical. I mean, the point is, I never got close enough. Like, I never got to a point where I could have hammered on the Quebec government or the federal government hard enough to tell me to stop. I say the Quebec government because the official opposition at the time was the PQ, and the one political opinion that you are allowed to express, and this gets back to the point you were making earlier about where you draw that line. Um, everyone from Lloyd down to the mailroom clerk is allowed to hate on separatists. I mean, in his goodbye letter, Lloyd talks about, oh, the referendum in 95. And you can totally rip the PQ on air if you want to. You can scowl and you can send all sorts of nonverbal cues about the premier of Quebec, but you have to be fair. You can just say whatever you want, basically, off air more than on air about separatists. So don't hammer the Quebec liberals too hard, right? Anyway, that's hypothetical. I never got in a position to find out. And the point is, I didn't want to stay and become. Did anyone see Terry Molesky on the campaign trail? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to, to poke in here again. Um, that's a really interesting point um, about the newsroom's biases. Um, and this is something that this should be transparent. If a newsroom has certain political biases, those should be made explicit. And really, they shouldn't even be there. Um, but if they are there, they should be known, whether either by revealing themselves or we need some sort of monitoring organization that evaluates the quality of the news coming out of each source and looks at its accuracy, what types of, if there, is there preferential bias um, is there, uh, what, you know, bias through omission? What are they not covering? What is one network covering that another one isn't, or one country covering that another one isn't? And that, uh, is something I'm just slowly kind of learning myself as I've been continuing my live news experience from looking at news around the world. 
there's a lot of big issues that happen in different countries. Um, but that's a thought I'm still kind of developing, and I've got some ideas I'm going to follow that up on in a later video. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to kind of highlight that as well again, that you know, the, the problems with news and journalism, and new, television journalism in particular, uh, is my focus. Um, uh, they are numerous, but they are knowable. And it's a matter of, one, informing yourself what types of biases, what, what you know, how, it's, I think it's a, it's, you know, it's the duty of a responsible citizen to understand how the sausage is made, how is news made, how, you know, and, you know, tries to, you know, expose themselves to as many different sources as possible so you can sort of, it, it helps to point out the bias a lot easier. If you're only getting your news from one source or a couple of sources like CTV or CBC, um, you are not doing yourself a service of actually learning about what's going on in the world. And this would be the same even if you were looking at your news through uh, through online presses. Again, you have to try and go and f vary your sources and vary them in both geography and in political tone. You know, so if there are conservative sources and that's your general, your, your, your default, you should be exposing yourself to liberal sources and trying to find them, uh, ones that are not, that are delivering news that's palatable as opposed to ones that are only reinforcing the biases that they're that they they've already assumed um can be challenging but it's not impossible today e even today anyway uh let's continue i mean kudos to him but he's not a happy person like it was great watching him get up there because there were like four questions a day and so molesky would go up and he would ask like a three minute question he said everything in it and then these conservative uh Supporters of the rally would be like, shut down the CBC! <laughs> and Molesky would just keep yelling, answer the question, answer the question. And Huck would be like, mm, that's completely untrue. So, <laughs> I didn't want to be that guy, right? I decided that I could do uh, more with my time and energy, I guess, um, by sitting outside of that system. And that's a personal decision that um, you can agree with or not agree with, but I'm way, way happier uh, right now. Um, so I don't have deadlines anymore. But the cool thing is that I do have these uh, these skills in this training, right? Like uh, I didn't get to do it at CTV, but I'm a trained video journalist. Like I can call and navigate and drive and shoot and edit and report and write in the same day, right? That's one of the things they taught us at the CBC. Um, radio skills, whatever. I've got a blog. I've got a Twitter account. I've got an iPhone. I forward a laptop from the Tai. I've got a pickup truck that's half paid down. Uh, so I have resources, right? And I have this network people, which I think is far more important. And that's not just the people who are still inside these organizations, but all the people that I was talking about earlier, who have all these different backgrounds, who aren't necessarily journalists, but who might be in academia or activism or, sure, the union movement, or they might be economists, or they might be freelance photographers or whatever. There's people out there who, I think, their instincts probably mesh with the ones that I ignore going in, and so they've never walked into this system. And then there's also people who are on the inside, who I know are this close to quitting, because they got in touch to say, oh man, if I didn't have a mortgage to pay, I'd go up the door with you, and go to documentaries. So, I'm totally committed to continuing my work. Um, the question is what form that's gonna take. And so that's what I'm looking for right now, is the blueprint, and that is why I'm doing this little tour, this is why I'm here, this is what I wanna ask you, is what you want out of Canadian journalism. Because you all nodded when you said, yeah, TV news could be better. And you all nodded when I said there are there are stories for which visual journalism works best. And we have people with skills, and we have resources, and we have networks. We don't have a lot of money, but there might be an alternative model up there. And there are people who are working on that right now. And that's what I've started to do, basically, is to go into the lab and try to come up with these models. And I'm going to be running these experiments over the next, could be 20 years, I don't know. But I've got a couple of doc projects lined up this fall, and I'm experimenting with like zero budget journalism that is totally free to consume and share, that you can <coughs> produce from a laptop in the desert and upload over a 3G connection and get in people's hands. The question is how can we leverage uh, the free technology and how can we piggyback off of the existing networks and the infrastructure that they have, which is massive, and the workforces that they still have. I mean, if you can piggyback off of those existing networks as sort of booster rockets to get these stories out there, uh, that's incredibly powerful. So these are all questions that I'm trying to answer right now, and I have a few clues, and I have a little bit of theory, and aside from that, it's completely trial and error. So 
if you guys have any questions, uh, or even better, if you have ideas that you want to share, uh, I'm done talking, so mm -hmm. let me turn it over to you. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll probably stop it there. If you'd like to watch the question and answer afterwards, you can. Um, uh, there are some interesting points in there, but I, again, that's kind of the main context of what he says. Um, but so there's actually some really good information in there, and that's helping my brain sort of turn and, and think about what I want to do here. Uh, but that last, the ending bit actually is, is perhaps the most fascinating possibility. Uh, that hasn't been, even now, hasn't really been developed much further generally. I'm not talking about, I, I haven't touched base with Kai in, in, well, since probably shortly after this was done. Uh, he helped me source the video clips that he had on this video that I produced, so you can, uh, so that's why the audio changes and it's much higher quality when we show his video clips, just because I actually got him to send me the links. I, think I might follow up with him and see where he's at. Maybe after I post this, I'll tag him and see if he's uh, got any more thoughts about how he sees the modern journalism evolving. Um, but I have some ideas on that myself, um, particularly YouTube, I think, uh, and its type. But you know, YouTube is because it's such a, it's the leader as far as video sharing goes. And, and there's a lot of communities that have started to prop up uh, on YouTube or pop up on YouTube. And, and I think that's something that certainly didn't exist back in 2011 to the degree that it does now. Um, it would have been limited back then to the, the you know the let's players of the game like the PewDiePie's and the Markiplier's and and the, and those sort of folks, um, but uh, so modern day though you're seeing a lot of that now. Like I watch um, there's a network of people that do entertainment news and, and like Screen Junkies and Collider and and a whole bunch of other satellite groups or different people that and they share uh, their ideas and stories and they and they they cross pollinate. There's a lot of uh, of cross you know interaction and I think. There's room for that today with with news, um, that you can do a grassroots news journalism, but it needs to be, you know, a somewhat connected network of people, so that when a news story, you know, affects multiple regions, that those groups can get together and communicate. Um, anyway, I, I haven't fully fleshed out the ideas yet, and I'm gonna. I've got some ideas about what I, you know, some things I'd like to try and do myself um, but I'll follow that up in another video I'm gonna finish that off here um, let me uh, transition back to the t title card here and yeah so that's that's basically it for this video I'll uh, upload this and let me know if you have some thoughts or, you know both on Kai's presentation and some of the comments that I've made if you do watch this all the way through I thank you very much I appreciate it um, and I will talk to you next time